Well, it depends. It depends on uh, what you mean by the first novel. Defoe could be, you know, I mean, there are lots of candidates for that. We're we're talking we're talking here a little bit about the uh, the term paper, and so I don't want to exclude anybody. Uh, some of the people who are just coming in from the conversation, and also those of you who are out there watching this on television. Uh, and we'll have lots of time to talk about the term paper, but one of the things that we were discussing was one student had suggested that he was thinking about writing about Afra Bain and her Orinoco, and he raised the very good question of, uh, well, what, yeah, I don't know, well, maybe, maybe Grendel is trying to get in, uh, but uh, raised the very good question of what, kind of thing are you supposed to do in the first part of your paper where you talk about the life and times of your author? In this case, let's say it's Offer Bain. What you would want to do in the first couple of pages, and that's why I suggested a couple of pages, though I'm not trying to count words or count pages for each section exactly. These are simply suggestions to you. But in a couple of pages is to sketch some of the details of the life and times of your author. What was going on? I mean, who was your author? What was going on in her life? What was going on in the world around her that affected her production of this particular novel? And there are a lot of interesting things that, that can be said. So that's where we were uh, in talking in the break. And uh, no doubt some of you will have further questions about this. And please bring up the questions along the way. And those of you who are watching this on television or on DVD, also, uh, please bring in your questions if you have questions. You can either come in or you can call in by telephone or you can email. Uh, there are all kinds of ways in which you can contact me and or the assistant instructor to ask these kinds of questions, okay? Well, let's go on now with Beowulf and we'll finish up with Beowulf and we're going to make a major transition in the course, the first of our major transitions to another historical period. So we have seen then the first two episodes, the great episodes at the beginning of the poem now, which focus on the great fights that Beowulf uh, fights against the monsters, Grendel and Grendel's mother, and of course is victorious. And once again is able to establish himself as the very powerful and here of course still very youthful hero. He returns home. He gives his own account of what happened in Denmark to his uncle Heoloch and Heoloch's wife and queen Higd. And then we have him giving all of the gifts that he received from Hrothgar to his uncle. Again, the exchange of gifts. And then his uncle, Heoloch, gives him gifts in return and lands in return. So, Gift giving, very important. We then move on. We have a fairly brief transition, though we're going to have a lot more of this information brought in along the way. And that has to do with the feuds among the Swedes, between Swedes and Geats, among the different peoples of the Scandinavian world, all of which will lead up to Beowulf becoming king among the Geats after his lord and kinsman uncle, Heoloch, is killed in the Frisian raid, something with which Beowulf is preoccupied throughout much of the work as he remembers his uncle and his uncle's death. Well, we move on and notice that when in Beowulf, and we're talking about this also a little bit during the break, when Beowulf makes reference to certain kinds of figures, uh, 
presumably important to the Scandinavians. And the Beowulf poet makes scattered allusions to different kinds of events among different tribal groups known to the Scandinavians. They're doing pretty much the same kind of thing as I was using an analogy here in the break as I might do with a group of people who had grown up in America and been educated in America. I don't have to tell you the story of George Washington and the cherry tree. You've probably heard that a million times. I don't have to tell you who Honest Abe was. You already know that. I can simply make allusions to those things and assume that you're going to catch on to what I'm talking about. So also with Beowulf. The very fact that the poem can make allusions without going into great detail about people, places, events, and so forth implies that those were already well enough known to the audience of Beowulf that they didn't have to be explained in detail. So, then we have the dragon. After Beowulf has ruled for 50 winters, quite a long time, we talked a couple of uh, classes ago about how old Beowulf would actually have to be. And uh, if you look at the chronology as it's presented throughout the poem, he has to be in his 70s at, at the very least. So, a thief sneaks in, apparently a thief who's on the run from his master. He must be, if not a slave, someone who was bound to a farmstead. And he has escaped, apparently, run away. He breaks into the dragon horde. He steals a cup. And apparently, he plans to use that cup to try to buy back favor with his master, perhaps even to buy his freedom. He could be something like what later on was known to be an indentured servant. But we don't know that. We don't know any more than what we are given here. So the dragon awakens, and the dragon is enraged, and the dragon is a terrible night flyer, because it's not only serpentine, the way, of course, as we all know, dragons are, but the dragon also has large wings, and it flies out over the villages. And the villages at this time used to have thatched roofs, which of course are highly flammable. Fire was a terrible, terrible danger at this time because it was extremely difficult to put fires out. And you were always liable to having things catch on fire. Part of the reason was that you did a lot of your cooking inside. And so it was always possible that the roof could catch on fire. And that would, of course, be absolutely disastrous, not simply for one dwelling, but we have lots of accounts of whole villages catching fire and just wiping out the whole village. And what are the survivors going to do? Where are they going to go? Especially if it's in the middle of winter. Well, here we have the dragon breathing out fire onto the village and villagers, causing terrible destruction. Beowulf is told, and here is where we get into that long section at the end that I was talking about in our last session, where, as Tolkien points out, the tone shifts from that more upbeat, optimistic tone, which was associated with the youthful and powerful Beowulf, and the celebration of light and happiness now the tone turns dark, turns moody, turns sad. There's an increasing sense of impending doom, both for Beowulf personally and, of course, for the Giddish people in general. And so Beowulf finally, however, is going to have to go out and fight against the dragon, which, of course, he does. And he says that he's going to do this alone, so he tells his retainers to stay in a safe place. 
But then when he goes to fight the dragon, notice for the first time, for the first time, not only does his sword fail him, but also for the first time, he realizes that he's not going to make it. He's not going to succeed. He's not going to be victorious. And he is almost completely overwhelmed until his kinsman, Wiglaf, comes out and says, you know, listen, I have many, many times pledged myself against the boast, right? I have many, many times pledged myself to loyalty to my Lord. And now is the time to stand up and be counted. And so he comes to the aid of Beowulf. They both get behind the, uh, the iron uh, shield, for some protection at least. And Wiglaf avoids the head, apparently, at least in part, because the head is where the fire is coming from. And he hits the dragon farther down, plunges his sword into the dragon, and then Beowulf pulls his short dagger, and he plunges that into the dragon, and apparently the heart of the dragon, or some other vital organ, because then the dragon dies. But in the meantime, Beowulf realizes that he has been poisoned by the dragon, and he's dying. He asks Wiglaf to bring him some of the treasure so that he can see what was the treasure that we fought over and that now I am dying for. And so he sees the treasure and then we have, again of course, we always have speeches being delivered and, and then he dies. Having given what he has left to Wiglaf. Again, gift giving. Wiglaf says to the guys who had been off in the safety of the, uh, of the woods, look, you know, once again, the whole question of the boast is a pledge. What about the fact that over the beer drinking, I have always heard from you guys all these high sounding words about how brave you would be in protecting our Lord in his time of need. Where were you now? And then we have the messenger who carries the news of Beowulf's death, victory over the dragon, but nevertheless his death, to the other Geats who are camped apparently in another place. And he delivers that message to them, but he also tells them about how their enemies who have been held at bay as long as Beowulf was there to protect the people and how those enemies now are going to invade. And then it is going to be a very, very, very dire situation for the people of the Geats. And we also know historically that the Geats disappeared as an identifiable people in the Scandinavian uh, peninsula. And they apparently were, in fact, overrun by their enemies and, uh, and absorbed so completely that we can no longer trace exactly who these people were, though various scholars have attempted to do so. Well, then the whole work ends with another funeral. Remember, Beowulf began with a funeral, and it also ends with a funeral. But this is not a ship burial. Remember the first one was a ship burial for Schild Scheffing? And while it's true that in that case he was put in the boat with his treasures, and then the boat was put out on the outgoing tide so that it would go out into the ocean and eventually, of course, it would obviously capsize. And that would be the end of that. But this is the symbolic journey into some kind of, of other world, one assumes. But also, the Scandinavians frequently had ship burials that were symbolic ship burials on land. On land. That's what Sutton Hoo is. You know, it's a, the ship was inside a burial mound on land. Uh, also, 
you can actually see there's a place in Sweden in which all of the, uh, the, the graves in a particular graveyard have stones outlining them in the shape of ships. So apparently this had very, very great symbolic importance for, if not all, at least many of the Scandinavian peoples or North Germanic peoples in terms of their funerary rituals. So we have the woman who comes out and she is the one who is wailing, which is reminiscent of a practice that continued in Ireland, obviously going back to very early Celtic times, for many, many, many centuries and probably thousands of years, which in Ireland is called keening, K-E-E-N-I-N-G, keening, uh, in which it's the women, not the men, but the women who wail over the grave. And uh, this also is no doubt an expression of genuine feeling, but it's likewise a symbolic part of the ritual and it's an important part of the ritual. And it apparently is significant that it is a woman who carries out this ritual function rather than a man. And then we have the warriors, the loyal warriors, riding around Beowulf's uh, barrow, as it is called here, or burial mound. And uh, of course, he's been cremated now, and they build up a great big mound over where he was, and they bury in there the treasure. Why? Because it is as useless to men now as it ever was. And remember again what I said about treasure a couple of classes ago. Treasure, wealth, those things are only valuable to the extent to which they are shared, not to the extent to which they are hoarded. And when they are hoarded, they are useless, or even worse than useless. And they remember Beowulf in the final lines of the poem as someone who was, of all the kings upon earth, he was the man most gracious and fair-minded, kindest to his people, and keenest to win fame. And fame is a good thing, by the way. It comes from the Latin word fama. And uh, fame is a good thing. And what it generally means is that it's a kind of ethical term for someone who has lived a good life and therefore has earned fame. Okay? So, uh, any final questions about Beowulf? Anybody have any questions? Want to raise it this time? Well, we can certainly come back to any questions that you might have. Yeah, have a question? About wealth, um, would the dragon then kind of symbolize that it doesn't really, it is, it's not worth it, it's worthy? Because right. It yeah, that's, that's true, that's true. And of course, it's interesting that it's a dragon which is uh, protecting this, you know, the, the treasure. You know, and the dragon is associated not only with violence and danger, but also with evil. So, um, you know, the, the, there, there are direct metaphorical associations here between the treasure hoard and the dragon itself. So. Okay, anything else? All right, well then let's move on. As I mentioned when we were doing our historical survey a couple of classes ago, the Anglo-Saxon period eventually comes to an end when Norman uh, William leads his army across the, uh, the, the, the English Channel and uh, was able to disembark in and around Hastings and then engage King Harold of England and his Anglo-Saxon army at 
Hastings, which is actually not in Hastings, but close by Hastings, and uh, to defeat the Anglo-Saxon army, and that began a whole new era in English history. And of course, the history of France as well, and the history of the British Isles in general. I say in France also because, you know, when you look at this from a Norman point of view, you think, or from, excuse me, from an English point of view, you think, well, yeah, you know, the coming of the Normans really, really fundamentally changed England. And it did. And it did. And ultimately, Ireland and Scotland and Wales as well, in certain very, very fundamental ways. But it also went the opposite way. It changed what was happening in France, too. Because the kings of England for a very long time saw themselves essentially as French. And many of them spent much, and in some cases most of their reigns as kings of England over in France. You know, I mean, that's where their roots were. And they spoke French. French was the official language of the court for over 300 years, for over 300 years. And as a consequence uh, of the Norman invasion and the takeover of virtually all of the lands in England and even beyond, French was the language spoken by the ruling classes and people who had dealings with members of the ruling classes had to learn French if they didn't already know French. So you had to be bilingual. Also, the Norman invaders had sooner or later to learn English because they had to be able to deal with the people who worked on their farms and who took care of their children and so forth. And uh, so the society became to a very large extent bilingual. Not totally. I mean, there were obviously some people who were French speakers and were not very good English speakers. There were some native English speakers who didn't know very much French, but almost everybody would know at least a little bit of the second language, what to them would be the second language. And many people would know quite a great deal. And some people would know more than just the two languages. I mean, if you were well educated, you also would have been educated in Latin. If you traveled on the continent, you probably would have encountered uh, German-speaking peoples and Italians and Dutch and so forth. Um, and the great writer whom we're going to be taking up next, Geoffrey Chaucer, he comes from a family of wine merchants. That's what they did. They uh, imported wine because England, you know, is uh, apparently incapable of, of growing wines or, you know, uh, wines that are very good. And so wines are typically imported from the continent. But then, of course, you have to have something in exchange because of the way commerce works. Uh, it's a quid pro quo affair. And so that's what uh, Chaucer's family did. And they were very good at it, and they achieved a pretty fair amount of wealth. They were not super rich, but they achieved a pretty fair amount of wealth, sufficient for Chaucer to have been reared in the household of the great nobility. And uh, Chaucer, all of his life, held various government posts. But that's still getting a little bit ahead of things, though not totally, because what is going to happen is not simply the language. And this is going to bring about a transformation of Old English into what we call Middle English. The language of Chaucer is Middle English. And I know some people sometimes say, well, you know, it's interesting to read the Old English of Chaucer. Well, technically, that's an incorrect statement. It's Middle English. And Middle English thrives in England from roughly, and this is very rough, around 1100 to around 1500. And then after 1500, we have another transformation of the English language 
into early modern English. And that continues until roughly the 18th century in which another set of changes brings about the transformation of early modern English into modern modern English. So, and of course English is still evolving all over the place in the English speaking world. So, uh, what else is happening? Well, as you move into the 12th and 13th centuries, what's going on throughout Europe? The rise of commerce, for one thing. Europe had been based on a primarily agrarian economy. That doesn't mean that there wasn't commerce. That doesn't mean that there wasn't some form of manufacturing. But the basic economy of Europe was agrarian. And the feudal system is based mainly on an agrarian economy. So that when lords hold large tracts of land, that land is valuable to the extent that it can produce. Produce what? Produce agricultural goods. What kinds of agricultural goods? Well, not only edible plants, but also edible animals and animal skins and the like. So that, in other words, the acquisition and the holding of land is valuable to the extent that it is productive. So that you have large numbers of people, this was not true in Anglo-Saxon England, by the way, so much, but you have large numbers of people who are in a lower class, a peasant class, or only just above a peasant class, who are producing the wealth for those in the upper classes. And at any time in the Middle Ages, the upper classes consisted of probably no more than about 5% of the total population. Now I know that people who like to have fun with, uh, oh, medieval, you know, dressing up in medieval costumes and uh, acting out medieval rituals and doing things like the Renaissance Festival or the Society for Creative Anachronism and so forth, all like to think of themselves as the nobility, you know, the great lords and ladies and so forth. Well, you know, I don't know about you, but I know where I would have been. You know, <laughs> and it wouldn't have been up in the top of the castle. <laughs> it might have been carrying the water to the castle or, uh, you know, cultivating some of the land around the castle, but uh, it probably wouldn't have been up there in the top of the castle. Uh, I mean, just think of the odds. So, what happened gradually. This didn't happen all at once, but what happened gradually is that as things began to settle down in Europe, roughly around the 12th and 13th centuries, I'm not talking about external wars where people were going on the Crusades and that sort of thing, but I'm talking about within Europe itself, and there was some kind of relative stability, commerce began to develop, manufacturing began to develop. There were certain revolutions in the kinds of agricultural tools that were being used, which actually made agriculture more productive. And so, as a consequence, wealth was being produced in ways other than agriculture. And as a matter of fact, in many cases, more wealth could be produced through commerce than could be produced through agriculture in many, many, many cases. Now, gradually, this is bringing about a transformation because gradually a whole social order is beginning to develop in which wealth can be accumulated outside of the old agrarian feudal system that had existed for a long time in, say, a place like France. And as that new economic system became more and more and more powerful, it came to challenge the power of the traditional lords, 
the traditional aristocracy, the traditional nobility. Now eventually this is going to lead to all kinds of social tensions and of course even farther in the future eventually going to lead to revolutions. And you may recall, and I'm jumping way ahead now, that uh, in the middle of the 17th century there's even a civil war which ends with the English king being imprisoned and having his head cut off by order of the English Parliament. But that's to get way ahead of the game. This is a process that took a very long time. What I'm talking about now. That gradual shift in the whole political economy of Europe from a primarily agricultural economy that supported in places like France in particular a feudal system that was very hierarchical in which there were vast numbers of people who produced huge amounts of wealth but to be enjoyed by a relatively small number of people. That doesn't mean that the peasants had nothing but they, they had to turn over a great deal of say their agricultural products to their lords who would then of course get the profits from most of that. So uh, that was the kind of system that also was imposed to a certain extent in England after the Norman Conquest. One of the things that uh, historians of Anglo-Saxon England have pointed out for a very long time is that it wasn't a democracy but it wasn't as rigidly hierarchical and there was uh, much less of a distinction between upper classes and lower classes. There was much more of a kind of democratic tradition, not in, a, not in our sense of democracy, but in the sense that uh, all of the people of the community would participate in the community activities, in, in the, you know, the building of buildings and the taking care of roads and all of those kinds of things. And it wasn't just you know, a, a rigid hierarchy in which you'd have a ruling class up here who by force of arms uh, with their, you know, their mercenary soldiers, uh, whom they would call knights and, and so forth, uh, imposing on a large population the requirement of producing for that relatively small number. That's not really true of Anglo-Saxon England. And uh, even in the term churl, the term churl is not a very good word, is it? I mean, you wouldn't want to be called a churl, would you? Or to have your behavior described as churlish? Well, the word comes from an old English word, churl, churl. And what that means is a free farmer, a free farmer. And free farmers made up most of the population of Anglo-Saxon England. And uh, that was a position of honor. You might not have a big farm, but you were a free farmer, you and your family. And uh, when the Normans came, they took that term and they turned it into a derogatory term. Oh, those are just the churls. For one thing, they were no longer free in the same way that they had been before. They now tended to be subject to Norman overlords. So, though that system would vary from one place and time to another, and these things are not all very smooth and even everywhere. And when you talk about a system like, say, feudalism, uh, it's not just a single thing. It's not a monolith that can be talked about in all of Europe from Turkey to Scandinavia. It would take different forms in different times and in different places. Now, in addition to all of this, there was the enormous rise in power and wealth of the church, of the church. The church in early Christian times had, of course, as you know, been persecuted. And then after the persecutions were over, uh, 
stopped finally by Constantine, the Emperor Constantine, at the beginning of the fourth century. The church began to flourish, and as we have discussed here, it began to spread from the Mediterranean uh, south and its Mediterranean centers into other parts of Europe, and eventually most of Europe was at least nominally converted to Christianity, and uh, there were monasteries and churches pretty much all over Europe by the, uh, the central Middle Ages. But then something very interesting began to happen. The church came to accumulate more and more and more property and money. And one of the ways this took place was that people would give their wealth either during their lives or in their wills after their death or other forms of property such as land to monastic foundations let's say, not only to monastic foundations. But let me just take the example of monastic foundations. Why would you do that? Why on earth would you do that? Anybody have an idea? Why would you leave your property, or, or at least substantial parts of property, or, or wealth, to a monastery? No, no thoughts about that? You don't want to go to hell. Yeah, that's true. But, but what would keep you from going to hell? Right. Okay. Don't forget to press your your button. Okay. If, uh, if they would say masses for you when you die, that would assure your place in heaven. And the only way they would say the masses for you is if you pay them. Yes. 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 And so uh, the the idea of purgatory began to develop at the same time. Now what that means uh, within Catholic tradition is that there aren't simply two places in the afterlife, heaven and hell. But the tradition gradually developed, not all at once, but gradually developed, that there could be some intermediate place. I mean, what about people who are not really wicked enough to go to hell. I mean, after all, that's pretty drastic, isn't it? Going to hell for all eternity and suffering and so on and so on for all eternity. Uh, but they're not really good enough to go straight to heaven. Must there not be some intermediate place where people, in effect, will serve time before they are purged of whatever guilt is remaining from their sins and before they can go on to heaven. So purgatory came to be believed to be that place. So that Dante in his Divine Comedy, you will recall, which is all about the places in the afterlife, right? Dante is taken on a tour of the places in the afterlife. Begins with the Inferno, or Hell, then goes to Purgatorio, or Purgatory, and then on up to Heaven. Right, uh, where he has a vision of, of what heaven would be like. Well, think about that middle place, because obviously most people in this scheme of things would end up in purgatory. Neither really good nor really bad, but you know maybe they did some stuff in their life that they had to, uh, to work out, so they'd end up in purgatory. Well, purgatory is not a very pleasant place to be, by the way. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's tough being in purgatory. So, what would happen in the judgment, <coughs> not the last judgment, but the particular judgment when you died, was according to this way of thinking, that if you were assigned to purgatory, you would be assigned there for a certain length of time. And that, of course, would vary according to how you had lived your life. And your good deeds during your life could be counted against your bad deeds. I mean, not that maybe you'd done anything really bad, you know, but you know, some of the stuff that uh, you had done along the way that uh, you needed to work out. Okay. Now, the idea began to develop that, well, what if I pray or do some other charitable work or good deeds on behalf of somebody else who has died. <coughs> Will that help to get them out of purgatory earlier? Uh, yes. 
Ah, yes. These are called indulgences. In England, they tended to be called pardons. But uh, the Latin term was indul indulgentia, uh, or indulgence. And so indulgences were very important. So you could leave property to a monastery where the priests in the monastery would say masses for you, the Catholic services, would say masses for you and otherwise pray for you. And this would help you to get out of purgatory or to get out of purgatory sooner than you would have otherwise. So that's a pretty good deal, isn't it? So your wealth is doing you good, not only in this life, but also in a certain sense in the next life. Well, unfortunately, as we shall see in Chaucer, not everybody did this. Not all of the clergy were corrupt by any means, but some were, some were. And some corrupted this whole concept into taking money for indulgences, in effect, selling indulgences. And that was, of course, what uh, absolutely scandalized and outraged the Protestant reformers. That was the main thing that Martin Luther was scandalized by when he was a young Augustinian monk, for example. Uh, the whole idea that you could have vicarious merit. That is to say that I could pray somebody else out of purgatory and it wouldn't depend on their own merits necessarily. So uh, the Protestant Reformation of course changed utterly that kind of thinking and that kind of system. And of course, what happened in reaction was that there was also a Catholic Reformation. Uh, it has traditionally been called the Catholic Counter-Reformation, but I understand from some of my historian friends that increasingly the term Catholic Reformation is coming into general use among historians of the period. So that what the Catholic Church said was, yeah, oh my God, we've got to clean up our act here, and went through a reformation of its own. So there was the Protestant Reformation and also the Catholic Reformation to try to correct these, these kinds of abuses. So um, <clears throat> what I'm getting at, though, to back up is that not only in secular society, were there all kinds of opportunities now for commercial development becoming more and more available to more and more people? Not everybody, not everybody by any means, but to more and more people in a process that was going to take centuries but would eventually change the whole structure of Western society. You know, what we call the rise of the middle classes Okay, uh, so that if you go back into the early Middle Ages, what you'll find is you'll find the nobility, and then you'll find a very, very large uh, group of ordinary people uh, who didn't have a whole lot. I mean, they weren't dying usually, but they, they didn't have a whole lot. And then a very thin, thin slice of a middle class, of an affluent middle class. And what's going to happen starting in the 12th and 13th, 13th centuries and going onward is gradually that middle class is going to expand. And of course that's going to create tensions at different times. Even political tensions and even political revolutions in some cases. Though those are generally far, far in the future. Some of the tensions, however, broke out in the form of peasants, peasants' revolts. You know, we know, of course, of the great peasants' revolt in Chaucer's lifetime in, uh, in 1381, in which 60,000 people marched on London and took over the government, drove out the king, and took over the government. Didn't last very long. And it wasn't ultimately successful in, in terms of getting what they wanted, though the English never forgot that. Never forgot that. That's always been part of the English memory, you know, of the, the revolution, that, that peasants' revolt of 1381.
And so there were actually hundreds of peasants revolts all over Europe during the entire period of the Middle Ages. And see, that's another thing we've got to be careful about when we're talking about the Middle Ages. We're talking about over a thousand years of history. So what's happening in one place at one time may not be happening at another place at the same time. And vice versa. So that what's happening in Italy may not be happening in Scandinavia. What's happening in Spain may not be happening in Ireland. What's happening in Ireland may not be happening in the German-speaking areas. So that these things are always uneven developments. And that's one of the most important things to keep in mind from an historical point of view. So, what we're going to see then is the gradual emergence of a new kind of society. And this is the kind of society that Chaucer is going to be not only a part of and a very successful part of, but he's also going to be somebody who will, in his literary work, will be representing this new kind of culture. Now, Chaucer could write courtly romances. You know, something like The Knight's Tale in the Canterbury Tales, or Troilus and Criseida. Those are very courtly romances. But on the other hand, Chaucer, as we shall see when we look at the general prologue, could deal with the hustle and bustle of real life, with all of the tensions and complexities of real life, and of people coming into competition with one another in the more or less free arena of this new political economy. The other thing that's going to happen that we'll be talking about at some length now is a change in the way women are viewed. Um, and this has to do with the rise of what is frequently called courtly love and the ethic of courtly love. You have, on the one hand, the Virgin Mary uh, being turned into a cult figure in which she takes over in popular piety, popular Christian piety in the 12th and 13th centuries to such an extent that she truly, truly, truly is a cult figure. Think of how many churches are dedicated to uh, the Blessed Virgin Mary. So, I mean, Notre Dame in Paris. I mean, what does Notre Dame mean? It means Our Lady, right? So we have that. And we have Mary elevated to the state of being the ideal, not simply of a Christian, but in particular of a woman. Now there are very interesting implications in that, which we will begin to pursue when we go on with this. But also with the rise of the the whole ethos of courtly love. There was a whole new culture in which people were deferring and paying court, in the literal sense of paying court to ladies and treating ladies as somehow or another above the common fray and uh, put up, as we sometimes say, on a pedestal. But of course, as contemporary feminists are very quick to point out, there's also the very difficult side of that as well, which we'll get into in our next session.